Listen up, get ready, I'm not gonna take no more. There's a revolution, a revelation going on in my soul. Buckle up, get ready, we're not gonna sit back. From Chicago, it's Michael James and another edition of the Live from the Heartland show. This one is for the week of May 6th, and we're recording it on Wednesday, May 3rd in the year 2023. Uh, we've got two guests today after I do a little uh, chatting away. Uh, we're going to have Alan Mills from the Uptown People's Law Center, and we're going to have the filmmaker Floyd Webb. So stay tuned for a lot of interesting conversation. And a little heads up next week, uh, our show for May 13th. We'll feature Alderwoman Maria Haddon, who is taking the lead in um, Chicago City's response to immigrants being sent here from the governor of Texas. We'll talk a little bit more about that. I'm going to share a few things uh, from the past week. Uh, I'm really happy to say that this book I've been working on that followed the exhibit I had recently uh, has come out. I picked it up yesterday. And already I'm uh, moving them around the city. Actually, in two cities so far, I've, I've had them. And um, I'm pretty proud of it. It's a lot of photographs from Mexico, Nicaragua, and Cuba. A little bit of writing, and I think you'll like it. For those of you who uh, are sometimes curious when we say live from the Heartland, uh, this show originated at the old Heartland Cafe, a place that Katie Hogan and I, along with Diane Libman, had started back in 19. 76. And while we're no longer live from there, Katie Hogan and I are working on a book about the heartland, and we put in some good time this week uh, bringing it along. So stay tuned. It'll be many months still, but uh, it's in the works. On a not so good front, but an opportunity for those of us here in Chicago to do good is the continuing process of sending migrants, asylum seekers from the Texas border to cities around the U.S. Um, since August 30th, 2022, the state of Texas has bused asylum seekers through private charter buses to Chicago at regular intervals. During the last several months, Texas officials dispatched buses with hundreds of migrants to Chicago, Washington, D.C., and New York City. While most asylum seekers are Venezuelan, uh, there are also individuals and families from all over the world. Uh, including Africa, Europe, and the Middle East. The city of Chicago has also seen an increase in asylum seekers arriving through other models of transportation, often without resources. NGOs and local governments along the border purchase airline or bus tickets to other cities like Chicago without any coordination. Since August 22, the city has shouldered the responsibility of caring for more than 8,000 men, women, and children. Um, as a welcoming city, we have a responsibility to provide access to shelter, food, and medical care to, any, to anyone and everyone, regardless of immigration status. Many of our new arrivals have walked hundreds of miles, navigating great danger through multiple countries in pursuit of safety and opportunity in the United States. We are committed to assisting each family and individual providing human services and respect with respect and dignity. So that's when I went looking it up on the web. Uh, but I also know that uh, Mayor Lightfoot has sent a pretty crisp letter to the governor of Texas about this process. And I don't think it's something that's going to end soon. It does give us a lot of opportunity to, uh, to really live up to our values. Uh, and I think that uh, these immigrants, like many before them, will be good for our wonderful city. And as I said at the top, um, Maria Haddon, the uh, alderwoman from the 49th Ward, my alderwoman, she'll be with us next week, talk a little bit more about this. You know, I've been to Danville, Illinois a number of times, usually uh, trying to just remember that I had relatives there way back, and also to visit the Danville Dan's baseball team in that beautiful old stadium. Uh, but right now, Danville is in the news because the city council has voted eight to seven with the newly elected mayor, Ricky Williams, an African-American gentleman, providing the tie-breaking vote to approve an ordinance restricting the delivery of medication and paraphernalia intended for abortions in the city of Danville. Uh, and this is not a good thing. 
Um, it's a, clearly breaking the law, and Attorney General Kwame Raoul issued the following statement after he sent a letter to the Danville Mayor Williams. They said if that ordinance passes, and it did, it will vi would violate state law. He wrote today, and that would be Monday, this past. I sent a letter to the mayor of Danville urging the city to reject the proposed ordinance that would violate the Illinois Repro Re Reproductive Health Act by purporting to ban or severely limit access to abortion care in the city of Danville. The Reproductive Health Care Act enshrines the fundamental rights of individuals to make autonomous decisions about their reproductive health. The act clearly states that units of local government cannot limit abortion rights, and Danville has no authority under Illinois law to enact a municipal abortion ban. It goes on, but you've got the gist. And um, apparently a lot of Catholic schools have been mobilizing students to show up at the courthouse. Um, I'm not sure what kind of response from people's right to an abortion is taking place down there, but I dare say that there will be plenty of activity. And, um, you know, we've talked about this before, how Illinois is sort of becoming a, a sanctuary, not only a state uh, that allows abortion, but uh, for other people uh, coming from other places. And I think what happened in Danville was since uh, abortion is severely limited or totally banned in Indiana, there was a clinic that we wanted to move to Danville. And that's kind of what set this off, and that's kind of what's at issue. So we will we'll tell you more as we know it. And um, we do live in a progressive state, or at least comparatively so, and hopefully we'll continue to uh, maintain that status. I got a notice from Move On. It just came and it said, Senate Democrats have the power to investigate Clarence Thomas's corruption. That's the Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas. They uh, move on, encourages everyone to contact their senators, particularly senators on the Judiciary Committee, call and say, hold hearings now. And that number is 855-384-6331. Once again, you want to call the Senate Judiciary Committee and tell them to hold hearings about uh, the behavior of Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas, call 855-384-6331. On the gun front, this is not happy news. Uh, we've had a number of shootings in the U.S. There's a lot of news about it, but I'm just wondering if all of the gun activity in this country is starting to influence other places, because as we went to record today, uh, eight children and a security guard have been killed in Serbia. So the U.S., uh, I think, is probably influencing other places. And guns, apparently, is not just an issue in the United States, but around the world. Okay, let's bring it close to home here in the mighty 49th Ward. Uh, I want to call your attention to the wonderful restaurant Smack Dab. It's now calling itself a community diner. They're located at 6730 North Clark, and on Wednesday at the beginning of the month, uh, Smack Dab has a, uh, a dinner, and uh, it's a vegan dinner, and everybody is welcome. It's free of charge, or donate $5 if you can. And this week, uh, they served up potato leek soup with all the fixings. I don't know what their plan is for next week, but it's a great place. A lot of fresh baked goods, a uh, number of former Heartland employees have worked there, and I do see uh, a number of people that I know whenever I go in there. So that's Smack Dab Community Diner, 6730 North Clark, and I now know that they have a monthly uh, meal for the community. One more thing regarding food, uh, the Vegan Museum is now located at the Sulcer Regional Library over there at 45, 4455 North Lincoln Avenue, and they will be there from May 1st uh, past to June 30th. And the bread shop was the place that uh, Kay first worked at, Kay Stepkin that would be, and she has put this vegan museum together. So now that it's in Chicago, not in the suburbs, I hope uh, more of our listeners and viewers will go on over and check it out. Uh, on a sad front, um, Gordon Lightfoot, the great singer out of Canada, has passed. Last week, we had uh, our comrade brother, Mike Klonsky, who does the show 
uh, hitting left with the Klonsky brothers uh, on our sister station, Lumpen Radio. He was on talking politics, and we had the, the formidable blues man from Chicago, Billy Branch, on. Both of those are good interviews. You can get them individually or the whole show at youtube.com slash heartlandmedia slash videos. And I am sorry to say that that show was not broadcast last week. We don't know what the, the hitch was, uh, but it happens in community radio. So it's a good thing that you can also get it on Google and Spotify podcast. You can watch it on Can TV at nine o'clock on Thursday nights on channel 21. And you can get it anytime you want at youtube.com slash heartlandmedia slash videos. Okay, we're gonna take a little break. And we'll be back with our first guest. We're going to talk about Illinois prisons. We're going to talk about tenants' rights. Uh, we'll be right back with Alan Mills. Stay tuned here on the left end of your dot. Listen up, get ready. I'm not going to take no more. There's a revolution, a revelation going on in my soul. Buckle up, get ready. We're not going to say Hey, hey, we're back with more Live from the Heartland. I'm Michael James. I'm your host today, and I'm really glad to be here with Alan Mills, someone I've known for a good amount of time. He's been a guest on this show before. He's one hell of a lawyer serving the people. And we're going to get a little insight into what the Uptown People's Law Center does and the work that they do, as well as uh, get some information about tenants' rights and prisons in Illinois. How are you today, Alan? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on. It's always a pleasure to come back to Live from the Heartland. Glad to have you back, brother. <laughs> uh, well, you started volunteering at the Uptown People's Law Center way back in 79. You come out of Northwestern's Law School. You went to work there. Eventually, I think in 2014, you were appointed uh, the executive director. And under your leadership, the Uptown People's Law Center has developed the largest docket in the state of Illinois, of civil rights cases filed on behalf of Illinois prisoners. So all true. All true. Give us a little history about yourself. You know, I like for hopefully for the younger listeners that they get to hear older guys, and I'm older than you, but you are not a kid anymore. Uh, how did you end up becoming an activist? How did you become an organizer? How did you become a progressive people's lawyer? Well, in part, it has to go back to my childhood uh, in the way I was raised. Uh, my mom was active in the civil rights movement back in Baltimore, um, she involved in sit-ins. Uh, Congress for Racial Equality was her was her vehicle for doing that back in the 60s. Um, I remember her getting arrested uh, at some sit-ins to try to desegregate some housing in Baltimore. Uh, I certainly remember as a very young age as running an old mimeograph machine, if you remember those old blue, blue I things. I sure do. Handles, right? and, it, <laughs> and it came out almost unreadable. Uh, today we have, uh, you know, Zoom and Facebook and all those things, but in the old days, you were cranking out the mimeograph machine by hand. So I did some of that cranking. I did some of the stuffing envelopes and actually got to visit a prison way back uh, when I was in high school. Uh, I was active in photography at the time, and my mom needed some pictures for whatever she was doing at the time. So I managed to get into a prison and take some pictures in Baltimore in the Baltimore City Jail. Uh, so that was my first, first exposure to prisons. Uh, and then my first exposure to civil rights also goes back then. Uh, my mom was close to Philip Berrigan, the mm -hmm. Catholic priest. Uh, he and his brother really started off the movement of pouring blood on draft records and later napalm and, and burning them. Uh, but his first action was actually in Baltimore, uh, the Baltimore Four, and got arrested, of course. And I got, went to trial, and I got my mom pulled me out of junior high school um, to sit through that trial. Uh, in the middle of which, and I thought the trial itself was fantastic because their defense was necessity. So they got to show all these pictures of the Vietnamese atrocities, a film about the Vietnamese atrocities. They were showing that in the in the in the trial itself. I thought that was a fascinating way to to defend against you know civil disobedience. Uh, and in the middle of the trial, Martin Luther King was assassinated, and riots went up in Baltimore. So they had to declare a mistrial. And I'm like, oh my goodness, I got to do something like this. Th this really catches me. Uh, and my mom was friends with both Berrigan and the, the lawyer who's doing the defense, so I got to have lunch with them. So I, after that, I was like, okay, I don't know what I want to do, but I want to be a lawyer, and I want to do this kind of civil rights community stuff, something like that. Then I moved to Chicago and ended up in Uptown totally by accident because my wife's only person that we knew in the entire city was a friend from high school who lived in Uptown. Um, so we stayed with her while looking for an apartment, found one, and then got involved in Helen Schiller's first campaign for Alderman. Uh, and from then it was like, okay, this is exactly what I wanted to do. 
I don't have to make it up. They're already doing it here in Uptown. Um, so I grabbed a hold of the opportunity as a second year law student and never let go. 40 years later, I'm still here. <laughs> That's nice. Uh, you know, you mentioned the Berrigan brothers a couple of times. I don't know, maybe your mother and my sister crossed paths. There was a, a film made called The, the King of Prussia mm -hmm. uh, about the Berrigan brothers, I think. And I know my sister worked in that film. Oh, cool. um, anyhow, and Tom Clark, who sometimes comes on this show, he knows a bit about the Berrigan brothers yeah. and a lot of that kind of thing. Um, well, let's talk a little bit first about tenants' rights in Uptown. Uh, I go way back to join community union starting in 1966. One of the things we did the most, I think we had the, the first collective bargaining contract with uh, building owners over at the Gutman building, I think, uh, on Kenmore Avenue. Yep. Uh, we had a lot of rent strikes. And I do remember spending a lot of time knocking on doors in Uptown, dealing with people's uh, legal issues, protecting them from getting thrown out going back into their basement and turning the electricity or the gas back on. Talk a little bit about your work with tenants and tenants' rights in Uptown. Well, I mean, I started off more or less where you guys ended, um, doing the same sort of work, uh, representing a lot of tenants. At the time, most tenants, I mean, Uptown has obviously changed a lot um, since 1979 when I first started doing this work. When I first started doing this work, we're still doing exactly the same sort of thing you're talking about. Slumlords, terrible conditions, rent strikes, um, all that kind of stuff. Um, and that's still going on to some extent, but really the uptown community has changed so much, massive gentrification happened. So really over the last 35 years or so, I spent a lot of my time fighting against that gentrification, either with a big class action lawsuit we did, um, but also just building by building, tenant by tenant, trying to keep people there. And as a result of that, but I don't want to say mostly the lawsuits, but mostly the great organizing that built on what you started, um, we have a lot of subsidized housing in Uptown now, uh, more than any other community area in the city of Chicago. Uh, and that includes both uh, senior citizen high rises run by CHA, uh, scattered site buildings run by CHA, high rises that are subsidized through HUD and now mostly are tenant owned or co-op owned. Um, so we've got 10,000 plus units of that kind of housing in the uptown, greater uptown area anyway. So a lot of what we do now is defending those tenants, um, either from being evicted or really a lot of it comes from community pressure and sadly our current alderman, who anytime they see young black men on the street say, well, there's gang activity there. And we've certainly been at these sort of so-called community policing meetings where tenants share tips saying, you know, if you see a bunch of black people on the street and you just call up the police, they're probably not gonna come. But if you tell them if they have a gun, then we'll be right out there. Um, so always report you see a gun, whether or not you see one or not, that's how you should report it. Um, <laughs> and it's like, and of course, these are all, these are not people wearing suits and ties. These are kids who live in the, generally live in the subsidized housing, because that's what's left for poor people up down to subsidized housing. Um, so, you know, there's been that pressure. And my favorite sort of example of this uh, is when the almost the first thing our current alderman did when he took office was remove the basketball rims from uh, the the play lot over near my house on Malden. Yeah, Street. I hate that. Yeah, I mean he's like because they're because it's next to a, a a school, and he's like, well, all these kids are hanging out in the play lot playing basketball, and they make it unsafe for the kids in school. I'm like, where would you prefer them be? Out on the street, hanging in the corner, doing whatever, or would you rather them playing basketball? And the principal of the school is like, we like them there. What are you talking about? We don't want those rims gone. So that was the first fight we had, and and it's just an attitude that whenever people are gathering on the street, they must be up to no good. And of course they're not. They're just trying to live their lives. Like you and yeah, I, I did my career teens, right? Or maybe not as bad as you and I did back when we were teens. I don't want to put anything on them. Uh, uh, I did some bad things, I know. Right. Alan, let so, me... You know, so that's where that, that our work these days is mostly defending people who are trying to be forced out of the neighborhood. Uh, give us a little brief uh, report on the politics in Uptown. You know, we had... Um, Helen Schiller for a long time, she was good. And then you got another alderman who now is retiring and you've just elected a new alder person who people are real optimistic about. And I'm very optimistic about Angela. Um, yeah. You know, unfortunately, uh, Alderman Kaplan won that election. There was a, you know, like 15 people running when he- You're talking about elected. last time. Yeah, well, when he started 12 years ago after Helen yeah. retired the first election. Once you're in, you know, it's much easier to get reelected. 
although he all of his reelections were very close uh, yeah by a few hundred votes uh but you know this time angela won uh won very handily uh i've known her for a long time she was actually in my my wife teaches high school here in uptown and she had angela as a student angela uh, clay angela clay right our current our soon to be alderman alderman Coming in. so uh you know i've known her for a very long time i uh, she's hung out on my back porch she's obviously a a person who's deeply committed to uh, ordinary people in the ward and making sure that they have a place and, and a voice and a place to stay. Um, so I, I think that w the opportunities over the next four years are huge. As with anything, an elected official can't do it alone. Uh, it's going to take organized people. So we're not going to give up and say, okay, we've solved all the problems in Uptown. We can go do something else. Uh, we got to maintain that organizational pressure to support her and make sure she does the right things and hold her accountable. Alan Mills, you talked uh, about gentrification in Uptown, and I, uh, with the first thing I thought was, well, it's still kind of rough edged in a number of places uh, compared to some other places, but it definitely, I remember back in the late 60s, they were tearing down everything from Montrose to Wilson, uh, you know, just west of the tracks, you know, and they tore it down, they built Truman College. Well, it's a great school in all kinds of ways. It's too bad they took out so much housing. But is Uptown, would you, uh, is it more than half uh, middle class? It used to be, you know, 90% poor people. Yeah, I would some... say it's it's significantly over half uh, not poor people these days. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, it, almost all the private housing um, that used to house poor people is gone. There's a few scattered buildings around, but the vast majority of stuff is, is subsidized where poor people live. Almost all of that private housing has been gentrified or torn down, and we have a Right now, there are three high rises on construction. Um, we just a couple years ago did a high rise where the old um, hospital used to be at Clarendon in Montrose, um, and uh, you know, unfortunately, the city under our, cur our current but soon to be uh, last alderman Kaplan um, gave them millions of dollars in TIF subsidies in order to build a luxury high rise, um, which nobody in the neighborhood can afford. Uh, <laughs> supposed to be used for slum and blighted neighborhoods, but instead is used to, to create a brand new lakefront high rise with one of the best views in Chicago. Well, I hope that some of those middle-class folks that have moved in uh, have pretty strong values. I think they probably do. They obviously had enough support to, to bring Angela in. Um, yeah, and she won you know, some of those, and she won some of those, you know, condo owning uh, precincts, absolutely. I know when we up here in Rogers Park, you know, we have a lot of people who will come to the neighborhood because they like, uh, you know, uh, a biracial, a multiracial uh, communities, but they don't always like uh, class diversity. Right. That's the key one is like poor people, no matter what their color, aren't necessarily welcome. Uh, so uh, it's an ongoing struggle. Uh, Alan Mills, you know, you I get notices from you regularly about stuff that you're doing in the Illinois State Prisons. And, uh, you know, I, as I said before we be began this interview, um, we got a lot of people, we got a state that we consider to be a pretty progressive state. And in a lot of ways, we've done some good stuff. But I don't think that would be true of our prison system. And you're the guy that had, could probably tell us um, you've brought an awful lot of cases around Illinois prisoners. Talk about your work in prisons, the status of the Illinois prisons and what people can do to make them better. So you're absolutely right. I mean, when I started doing this work with prisoners, it was really because people from Uptown went to prison. Uh, and those folks that started started the Uptown People's Law Center, and I've been here for a while, but not from the beginning, um, very much believe that when somebody from the community went to prison, they were still part of the community. Just like we consider homeless people our neighbors, not some outside invading force. Um, we also consider people in prison who came from our neighborhood to be part of the neighborhood. Um, so that's how we got started. But since then, it's really expanded. Um, we currently have six class action cases going around the entire state um, and another dozen or so individual cases. And I, as I, when I started doing this work, I thought of Illinois, like you say, it's a good, solid blue state, relatively well off. And therefore, I figured we probably had decent prisons compared to everywhere else, and we're just trying to change it. That is totally untrue. Um, as we've been working with experts who are the ones who are trying to tour prisons all over the country, we're told that we're in in the battle for the bottom with places like Alabama, um, places like Oklahoma, 
uh, places like Texas, places that make the news and that everybody says, well, yeah, it's Alabama. Of course, they got terrible prisons. But then you come to Illinois and we got very much the same sort of prisons. You know, our three maximum security prisons are all over 100 years old. The oldest of them in the was, was started in the 1800s. Uh, the newest of them, State Bill, was finished in the 1920s. Um, and they are showing their age. I mean, State Bill, they did a study 50 years ago saying they ought to close it because it was past its useful life. Here we are 50 years later, they're still running it. And part of the problem in Illinois is we tend, we have tended to, until the last couple of years, uh, promoted from within. And therefore, there's not that kind of cross-pollination of what of how prisons are developing, how better better procedures are being put in place in other prison systems across the country, because we just keep doing things the way we've always done things. So in many ways, we're stuck in 1970. Um, and of course, that was before the huge uh, increase in prisons, in, in prison population. Our prison population has grown, grown from, you know, a couple thousand to where we were at our peak, almost 50,000. We're now thankfully back down under 30, thanks to our current governor. So I think our current governor is, is good on the idea that he doesn't like prisons, and that people ought to get out of them, but he's not so good in paying attention to what's actually happening for those people who are still in prison. How do you, how do you think, Alan Mills, how do you think uh, the movement, uh, the you know grassroots, politically conscious folks, uh, what kind of steps would you suggest we take to improve our prisons? And besides calling our state reps and people we know, and we hopefully could bend their arm a little bit, uh, but it's, uh, you know, there was a time when, you know, the Panthers used to bust people to prisons. Uh, we talked a lot about prisons back in the Rising Up Angry days. Um, but, you know, it's kind of not been in the in the discussion much lately. How do you bring it back and what are some concrete things that we should ask for or demand? So I think that one of the, I mean, obviously we need to get people out of prison. So, for example, this year there was a an elder parole bill. Because Illinois doesn't have parole. So we had a bill that said anybody who'd been in prison for uh, more than 25 years and had spent, uh, I'm sorry, had spent more than 25 years in prison, was over the age of 55, should have an opportunity to parole out. There's no reason to keep these old people here. They're also sucking up huge amounts of our medical uh, expenses in prison because they- I'll bet. Yeah, I mean, we've got people who are totally disabled. We've got people who need 24-hour round-the-clock care. You have people who are bedridden, who have to be turned every couple hours or they develop bed sores. What are they doing in prison? There's no reason whatsoever that they're in prison. It's the most expensive possible way to provide medical care. And of course, they're not eligible for Medicaid. So we're, we're putting the entire bill. So those people should get out. But I think the bottom line is there's been, there's this weird disconnect between people who are fighting for like, for example, mental health care on the outside. We had a really great movement in Chicago and it's still continuing when they tried to close all those neighborhood clinics. There was right. a, real, a real movement of mental health care, but it never connected and included those people who were inside prison. And getting terrible mental health care, and those links just have to be rebuilt. It's prisons are not separate from society; they're they're like a microcosm, and they they share all the same problems. You've got you've got a great movement for disabled people on the outside. You know that has become a real political force, but they tend not to talk about disabled people who are in prison. Um, so you know, I think that what really is needed is that those linkages need to be rebuilt, so that people who are it shouldn't be a separate prison movement. I'm not all in favor of that, but it doesn't have to be separate. It just has to be linked to the stuff that's going on on the outside. Uh, and the same with race. I mean, frankly, there's been great organizing about racial um, equality and, and discrimination and police abuse and all that on the outside. I would say the, the police abuse and the racism of the police system doesn't stop at the point you're arrested. Yes. It gets worse. <laughs> but all the attention is to what happens at the point up to the point of arrest. After that, it gets worse. Well, Alan, I want to. I want to. Uh, first of all, before I got another question, but I, uh, I want to invite you to come on anytime you want when there's stuff going on that's relevant to prisons. And I want to ask you. I got two things. But I want to ask you first. Uh, what do you take on the status of uh, Cook County Jail? I would imagine your law work takes you there too. Uh, you know, we've always liked Tom Dart. He gets some good press. He gets some bad press. He, like you, has been a guest on this show. Uh, we, when he came on, we played that song, I Fought the Law and the Law Won. Um, <laughs> but uh, what's your take on Cook County Jail and the status of that and what's going on? Um, you know, I think I, I, I have sort of mixed feelings about Cook County Jail. On the one hand, I think Sheriff Dart uh, has self-labeled himself the most progressive sheriff in the country. And that's probably true. 
Um, but it's also a pretty low standard. Uh, you know, <laughs> sheriffs don't tend to be the most progressive people around. Uh, so you can be the most progressive sheriff in the country without being all that progressive. I think that uh, Sheriff Dart has lots of um, good intents. He certainly understands the system, but he will be the first to tell you that Cook County Jail is still staffed by way too many, what he, he said in the papers, Neanderthals. Uh, people who are doing things the old way still believe the way you're on a jail is to hit people over the head. Um, still believe that the purpose of jail is to punish people uh, rather than just to keep them safe while they're waiting for trial. So, you know, I, I, I've sued Tom Dart. I've supported Tom Dart. I've done both of those things. Um, the jail is a jail. It's, and the idea, the bottom line is we should have a lot fewer people in it, which Tom Dart agrees with. I'm not sure we agree on exactly how small it should get or who should be released, uh, but we both agree it should be a lot smaller than it is. Alan, let me ask you one last thing. You know, uh, you're not the only outfit that deals with prisoners in Illinois. Uh, and we've had uh, a number of people from the People's Law Office, not the Uptown People's Law Center. And I, you know, I, I really have a lot of admiration and respect for both outfits. I wonder if you guys ever talked to each other, uh, have done anything together, and if you're friendly with each other or you compete for, for cases. <laughs> Sadly, there's no competition. There's way too much to be done. So we're not competing with anybody. Right. Uh, yeah, we talk all the time. Um, there are good friends. Um, you know, we both have similar sorts of roots back in the 60s and the Black Panther Party and all that really came out of that different different aspects of it. But we all have the same roots and we all deal with the same people. You know, they've really focused a lot more on police misconduct. We focus a lot more on on prisoner rights. But but there's obviously an overlap um, and they still do some great prisoner work. So, yeah, right. we, we love the People's Law Office. They're doing great work. You're my two favorite uh, legal outfits. Uh, <laughs> as we close this segment, do you have anything that we left out or anything that's really pertinent or anything you, words of wisdom you would like to share? I guess, I guess what I would really, the final words I have is we have to stop ignoring prisons. Um, they're not some separate entity here. They're where society hides its problems. Just like we don't solve the homeless problem instead of we, we arrest homeless people. We don't provide decent mental health care on the outside. Instead, we criminalize it. We criminalize our social problems. We need to pay attention to prisons, and we need to stop sending people to prison rather than solving the problems. And if anybody wants to get a hold of you, they can just go on and find Uptown People's Law Center. And we have a website with right lots and lots of information in it, a uh, way to contact us. If you want to volunteer, let us know. If you have a case, a loved one in prison, let us know. Uh, we have a mailing list you can sign up for, which you're already on, I know. Um, everybody else should join, too. Get the same same information Michael James has. <laughs> Thank you, Alan Mills. Keep doing good in the world. You're a hell of a guy, and I'm going to look forward to seeing you in person in the not too far off. I will be back on as soon as I can. All right, have brother. All right, and everybody stay tuned. We're going to take a little musical break, and we're going to be right back with some really interesting information about the children in Japan of USGIs and what happened to them. Stay tuned here on the left end of your dial, 88.7 or WLUW.org. Be right back. Listen up, get ready, I'm not going to take no more. There's a revolution, a revelation going on in my soul. Buckle up, get ready, we're not going to sit back. Hey, hey, welcome back to more Live from the Heartland. I'm Michael James, uh, here with Live from the Heartland for the week of May 6th. And I'm really honored to bring on someone I've known for a number of years now. He's one hell of a filmmaker, a guy. Know me a since of... I was. Four... So what's I've that? Known me since I was 14. I knew you since you were 14. Yeah. How uh, so? When you came to Proviso East, where we had that anti-war stuff. Oh, nice. Well, and we were Floyd Webb is right. our guest. Floyd Webb has turned into one hell of a filmmaker. Probably got politicized back when he was 14. <laughs> yeah. And um, what I'd like to do, you're going to talk to us about a documentary that you're making, uh, films in general, but I want to uh, have you share a little bit of information, Floyd, about how you became a progressive activist guy and a progressive filmmaker for the well, young people who need examples about uh, people devoting their lives to the cause. Yeah. Well, you know, I hate to sound like Steve Martin, but I was born a poor black child in Mississippi. But that's real. I was I was born in the Delta, 
in the Mississippi Delta, uh, 1953, came up to Chicago in 1958, moved, lived on the West Side, you know, but I had come up under some really interesting people in Mississippi. I had, you know, my, my crazy uncles and my grandfather who kept gas operated shotguns by the front and back door and a trap door in the floor. And, um, you know, it, it, it was survival mode, right? And, uh, but they were really industrious, you know, like just ordinary working class people. I mean, agrarian people, you know, but they were all skilled, you know, uh, they were all skilled people, Car carpenters, you know, uh, mm -hmm. bootlegger, <laughs> you know, that, that kind of stuff. You know <laughs> what I mean? It goes hand in hand. And, but when I moved into Chicago, you know, like I, I lived on the, lived on the West side, but when I moved to the South side, lived in the projects and where I lived in the projects on 22nd and state street was a real unique area. I lived two blocks from Muhammad speaks newspaper, two blocks, two and a half blocks from the Chicago defender, five blocks from Johnson publishing, three blocks from chess records, four blocks from VJ records up the street from Ahmad Jamal's uh, um, Alhambra jazz, jazz club, right? And I had to run in the neighborhood when I was a kid. So I'd run errands, I'd work places, I'd sweep out the, I would like sweep out the printing press up at Muhammad Speaks newspaper. I would de deliver the, the Chicago Defender. I would sell the uh, Jet pub publication, uh, Jet magazine, which was a little, little black magazine. I remember so, Jet. So big that came out every week uh we would sell sell down you know we we were like hustling we would hustle we got jobs when we were seven years old because mom thought that food was more important than, than comic books so we had to make our own money to do that and hence we had these adventures you know and i just happened to know a lot of really interesting people like all the people who ran who who worked at uh the people who, who ran muhammad speaks newspaper were all from had all come from the daily world right uh malcolm x had hired had hired them away from from the daily world so they were all either communists or ex-communists you know uh we had people in on the south side community one guy named uh hammurabi rob who taught black history in the street he printed his own publications you know um anytime you you could go to any beauty parlor barber shop pool hall and you would find his little booklets on black history you know so we were exposed to our history we had you know uh counter to what a lot of young people believe today that nothing was hidden it was just in a book and somebody had to point it out to you you know and so we had people that did that matter of fact you couldn't go in a barbershop without there being some kind of debate about history or like you know or like these people with these incredible memories about baseball averages and all and and who and who did what you know what i mean history was history and activism was part of was part of that upbringing you know in the early 60s you know like while, while i was growing up the first significant thing i remember was the conversations around castro riding into havana in january that that january 1959 you know, you know, we, we had the news. Everybody watched the news. Everybody had dinner around the dinner table, but we watched the news religiously. We watched Walter Cronkite. And Walter Cronkite's reporting on on Castro, you know, ri riding into Cuba. And like and, and you would go to the barbershop and they'd be talking about you'll never see that again. Never see what again. You see all those black soldiers behind Castro? You'll never see that on TV again. And they were right. Because Castro, because little did I know, Castro had when Castro uh, had uh, had come into the country, he he went into the Orient uh, in the Orient uh, mountains, and lived with those rebelled with with the descendants of those re rebelled slaves who had uh, uh, something called palinquids up in those mountains, and wow. that's and that was the base of the Cuban Re Revolution. A lot of people don't know that because of the way history always leans towards white supremacy. So to that give. Does. <laughs> So to give black so so to give black soldiers any kind of credibility in, of, of participating significantly in the Cuban Revolution is to give is, is to give black people in general a power that they don't want us to know that we actually have. 
you know, hey Floyd, let me butt in here because we will have a limited amount of time. And I know, I, I know. Let me I'm ask you how you became a filmmaker. When did you okay, well, take your progressive filmmaker. politics and turn it into being a progressive filmmaker? Well, I, I moved. Uh, my dad was in Vietnam. He came home. We moved out of Maywood. I, I mean, we moved out of the projects to Fort Benning, Georgia. Uh, got politicized there, actually. That's a, 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 another long story, because that was in the middle of the civil rights movement. Uh, came back to Chicago. Oh, while I was in in the projects, I became a member of the NAACP youth, youth group, uh -huh. of which Fred Hampton was the leader yeah. of the NAACP youth group in Maywood. Ended up moving from Fort Benning back to Georgia, because my dad went back to Vietnam, moved to Maywood, Got involved there because we were having race riots all the time. This is about the time that I met you. We were because we were having seasonal race riots, and we put out a newspaper. We put out a, a newsletter because this is a time of student activism too. Student activists, you know, let's we must not forget this is also a, a time period in which there was so much student activism right down to the high school and the elementary schools over dress codes, all 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 kind, yeah, kinds of things. Big time. And and we put out something called Gideon. Babel, and it was an anti-racist. It, it was an anti-racist, anti-imperialist, anti-war document that we Xerox in the school when no one was looking, you know. And and from there, you know, like I got involved with 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 Black Panther Party, when, because when when King got killed in '68, we had 600 members of the NAA of the youth group of the NAACP when Fred was head of it. When King got killed. Fred went from being head of head of the NAACP youth group to joining the Black Panther Party behind his stealing the ice cream or him being accused of stealing the ice cream and distributing it to the kids. Stokely Carmichael and members of SNCC came out to Maywood to help him raise money for his court case. And that's when they recruited him for, for, for the Black Panther Party, right? And, and so that's where it starts. Uh, with And I was, and I started taking pictures and things and and uh, so I ended up becoming a photojournalist, right? But it's out of that experience. Like the first film I ever programmed was because uh, I also became uh, I became a co-director of the of the uh, National Committee to Combat Fascism in Maywood. Uh huh. In 1970, after I graduated from high school, me and me and Joe Hoffman, Chick Hoffman's brother, right? Who I was. Who, matter of fact, we we were sure. all involved in Gideon's Babel, right? So uh, yeah, so. So it all starts there. I became a photojournalist. I left the country. Um, uh, the Vietnam War is almost over, but they tried to get me because I was, uh, you know, they actually, the FBI kind of interviewed me because I was, I lived up the street from Bob Avakian. Bob Avakian was living in Maywood at that time. Bob Avakian is from the Revolutionary Union or whatever it's called. Revolutionary, right, it was Revolutionary I Union. I remember him from Berkeley. I knew, I knew him. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. So I had been working on the people. So you know, once again, I'm working on newspapers and stuff. I was working on the People's Voice, which we distributed at all the factories in the area, right? And uh, so when I had that problem with with the FBI, I was like, well, I had been wanting to leave anyway, and and, and I knew a bunch of people that had gone to Mozambique and had gone to uh gone gone to Tanzania, and I got up and went and ended up in Tanzania. Um, living next to the uh, to the uh, re uh, to the refugee refugee camps for uh, for Frelimo, FPNLA uh, from 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 Angola and Umkatawa um Sizwe from the uh, armed the uh, armed unit of the uh, ANC. So I got that's to work out with Congress. Yeah. So I so and so that's kind of like you know so that's kind of like where it all starts. And uh, you know I came home after you know. Um, the uh, the uh, Carnation Revolution in Portugal ended ended Portuguese imperialism, and it ended the war. But then a civil war started, you know. And uh, you know, I got sick with malaria, and I had to come home. Plus, there was there was so much happening, which is a whole other story that I, that that I that I kind of stayed away from. Um, and I came back here and was you know was like because I never thought I was coming home. I, I you know I had I had no plans for coming back to the states really, you know. So yeah, I ended up once back in Chicago. It's a hard place not to come back to. Well, you, you know, it, it wasn't Chicago so much that I just didn't want to be in America, you know. And and it was and it was uh, and I was getting insights that I just never would have gotten had I stayed here, you know. And so when I came back, I went to college, 
And Chicago got interesting when I when I dropped out of college and came back here and um, and got involved with with like Chicago filmmakers. And um, and, you know, we, we started a, a, a black light film 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 festival. Right. And um, and just, you know, just 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 I mean, it just expanded from 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 there. You know, the festival got known all over the world. We were one of the first black film festivals uh, starting in 1982. You know, there were there were, uh, there were, there, were, there were about four black film festivals in the country at that time. Well, this is good. I'm getting a little history. Excuse me, I'm dropping my phone. Don't mm -hmm. need it. Uh, I did a lot of things I didn't know about you, but I'm, I'm yep. really glad you shared them. Uh, we were going to talk about films today. We were going to talk a little bit about the film about Count Dante. I'm going to leave that for another time. Uh, mm -hmm. You and I ran into each other very recently, actually yesterday. <laughs> yeah, uh, and um, we uh, one of the things you told me about, which really seems very interesting to me, is about a film that you're working on about the children of American GIs in Japan, uh, and they would be, you know, white, black, Latino, but the focus here is on uh, those of, who had black fathers who were in the military, right. the way they were right. treated, and you. Uh, you, there is a movie that was made, I think, in 1959 right. about two of these children. Why don't you fill us in and just give us yeah. details? Because yeah, it's a it's okay. a tragic story in a lot of ways. Yeah. So uh, the American occupation started in 1945 and lasted to 1952. During that time, over 10,000 children were born of the union between uh, Japanese women and and American soldiers. Uh, the American government made it very hard for these guys to get married to Japanese women because they were marrying the enemy, quote unquote. And these and, and the children weren't necessarily welcome because America had a had it had in most of the states the soldiers came from, miscegenation was was against the law. You know, it wasn't until you know, and, and so they didn't know what to do with that. So they didn't do anything until after the American occupation was over. So these kids were all born, and it was very difficult for them to, to, to be married. So, so a lot of the soldiers had married the Japanese women in Shinto weddings and not Christian weddings. But the, but, but the, but the marriages still weren't recognized, right? So these, a lot of these kids got left behind. You know, Nobody knows how many children there actually were. A lot of them were put up for adoption, not, and a lot of them didn't get adopted here. You know what I mean? Because there just wasn't a policy until like the mid '50s that uh, that 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 the ad ad adoption started. So a lot of these kids were left behind. Tadashi Amai was a left-wing Marxist filmmaker who made social realist films, and he had been uh, he had been uh, purged out. He, had, he uh, they had a red purge in Tokyo, and he was pushed out of one of the Japanese studios. They formed their own studio. And they looked at this subject and decided that they wanted to do this film in 1959. So I showed the film in Chicago for the first time last year at Chicago Filmmakers. And I asked the person who helped me find the film if we could find the two actors that were in the film who were then kids. And she went out and found them. You know, so we so we found both of these well, both of these guys, these uh, this this uh, this young man and woman who were like. 10 and 12 years old in 1959. Now they're in their late late 70s. And uh, we've started making a film about what their life has been like since they made this film. This film won all kinds of awards, right? But it was never shown in the United States until we showed it last huh. year. It's, it's crazy. I can't so believe it. So the name it. of the film is, is Kiku, Kiku and, and Isamu. Isamu. Yeah, yeah. K-I-K-U and Isamu. I-S-A-M-U. And we have a website that's kikulegacy.com, K-I-K-U-L-E-G-A-C-Y.com, and you can get more information. We're having a crowdfund to raise $5,000 so we can keep shooting. We started shooting February 3rd during the uh, first day of spring, set, sets a bone. So, uh, so we've got to raise $25,000 more to keep shooting uh, uh, at, at the end of the uh, summer. So this trailer, and, this trailer uh, that I watched, yeah. uh, it's... Um, mm -hmm. You only, that's only a couple months old. You just shot that? Oh, I just, yeah, 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 yeah. We, yeah, that footage was shot February 3rd. 
So you went you went back to Japan. No, 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 no. I didn't go. I have a producer who's working with me here who speaks Japanese. Okay. And the and the and, and and the American woman that's gonna be director has been living in Japan for 30 uh, years. Deborah DeSnow. So I'm working with Deborah DeSnow and, and Yuki Solomon, who lives here in Chicago. Deborah has a company in Japan, she's been living there 30 years. Well, tell Floyd, tell me a little about these two people, Takahashi Imido and uh, George uh, Tak Yama. Okay, uh Takahashi Imiko, um she had a very, a very powerful grandmother who really gave her a good sense of identity, you know? So when she was coming up, she was taught not to be rejected, not to even accept any rejection. Her grandmother told her she was Japanese. You know, George, on the other hand, had a different experience, you know? Uh, Emmy was surrounded, after they made the film, they were surrounded by a really supportive community. And the film changed a lot of people's minds about how they had been treating these 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 children. The film had an had had an immense effect, you know. Um, and she's gone on to be like a, a pretty popular singer. She does she does two or three concerts a year. Uh, George was in the music business. I'm not sure what he's doing now. George lives in Osaka. Um, uh, Emiko lives in uh, li lives lives in Tokyo. And in and, uh, and one sec section of Tokyo, whose name I can't remember right now, you know. So, uh, yeah, so we're going to be talking to them and looking at, there's other characters in Chicago that are involved in this story, too. Um, there's a, uh, a woman journalist who worked for the Chicago Defender, Ethel Payne. Ethel Payne re reported on this issue, you know, a uh, very famous woman. She was the woman who actually, she questioned Eisenhower about civil rights which actually brought the subject of the civil rights movement to fore because she was the first black woman and first black journalist to work in the White House press, press corps, you know? So, um, yeah, so... So, Floyd, let me ask you a little bit about... Uh, tell us the name of the original movie. Is it available? Can people see it, or they got to wait? The, the original film is Kikuto Isamu, K-I-K-U-T-O Isamu, which is just K Kiko and Isamu. No, you can't see it yet. I was lucky because I knew somebody there uh, who helped me lo locate a copy of the film, and uh, and and we've been now. It's supposed to be distributed, but it hasn't been distributed yet. Okay, and what's the name of your documentary you're working on? That you're it's to called make some Kiku's Legacy. The, the film title of the film is Kiku's Legacy, and the website is kikulegacy.com. K i k u l e g a c y dot com. And you can sign up for uh, our mailing list. And if you're interested in the uh, in our uh, crowdfunding campaign and want to help us finish this film, you can you can become part of, part of the crowdfund. And you can also email me at floydweb at gmail .com. Yeah, well, I hope a lot of people do. Now, Floyd, uh, what's the general situation though of all of these ten thousand kids? I don't know what percentage of them would have been uh, African Japanese. Uh, or African American Japanese, uh, but what what is the status? I mean, do they have any rights as uh, they should have been American citizens as well no, as they Japanese don't. citizens? No, they no, they had a problem with with with, with Japanese identity too. You know, and so I'm not really sure. That's one of the things we're going to discover. Yeah, it's I was just wondering if there are any legal ramifications. That well, these... in Japan, there could be. I just don't really know. But, you know, that's what we're finding out, you know, about what, because it's very hard to become a Japanese citizen, you know. Um, and, um, and like, they did bring, it's interesting. A lot of Japanese descendants from Brazil came back from Brazil because the Japanese had gone to, uh, to farm in Brazil at the turn, turn of the century. So a lot of their grandkids and great grandkids wanted to come to 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 Japan, and they were welcomed, you know. So so things have changed since the end of World War II. Remember that they were beaten, right? I mean, they they were beaten and they were beaten horribly. They were two atomic bombs were dropped on them. The place was a mess. The emperor came on television. I mean, came on the radio and 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 told them that they were going to have to to bear the unbearable, right? And and like a lot of the young Japanese girls after the war were forced into prostitution by the American occupation forces. They were forced to, to become comf comf uh, comfort women, you know, just like the Japanese made 
Korean women com comfort comfort right. women. You know, so 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 these are the parts of that story that make it really compelling. Well, Floyd, we're about out of time, and okay. um, I want to thank you for coming on. And I'm yeah. glad we got a lot of history about you, and we introduced people to this new project because I watched the trailer, uh, and it has clips from the original movie. It has a grandmother telling uh, her, you know, this one of the kids that uh, her father is Japanese or he's American, and um, it's something else just to watch that short trailer. And I imagine we can run a few seconds of it on our uh, on the visuals of this show. Um, okay, cool. You'll, will you come back on another time? Sure, when got sure, to share? sure, sure, any, sure, anytime. And yes, Count Dante is coming. As a matter of fact, WBEZ is doing a podcast and a big web web page about Count Dante coming up in June. Count Dante was a white guy who introduced a lot of martial arts to a lot of people in Chicago, including African Americans. He attacked various dojos. Someone got killed. It's an interesting story. And we'll yeah, it's we a crazy talk story. about it. I know you've and been working on a Count Dante project. My for, cousin Adam forever. James, who, yeah. who comes on the show, he's got something going on. Uh, we'll talk more about Count Dante in the, in the future. Okay. Thanks All a right. lot. Well, I want to thank everybody for tuning in to this week's Live from the Heartland for the week of May 6th. And uh, I want to particularly thank uh, our guests, Alan Mills from the Uptown People's Law Center and filmmaker Floyd Webb. Uh, both of them filled us up with a lot of information. I do want to uh, encourage everybody to do what Athletes United for Peace do, and that would be do sports, not war. I do want to thank everybody who makes the show possible, particularly our engineer, Hal James, our uh, co-producers, co-hosts, uh, whenever they want to, Tom Clark and Katie Hogan, our music producer, Lynn Orman. And uh, we're going to be back next week again. We're going to have uh, Alderwoman Maria Haddon talking about the uh, asylum seekers coming to Chicago and the challenges and opportunities that affords us. And just so you know, you can go to youtube.com slash heartlandmedia slash videos. You can find hundreds and hundreds of entire shows. And then for the last few months, you can find the individual segments. It's all there for you. And uh, let us know what you think of the show. You can get me at fatback at aol.com. Uh, we'll be back next week. We encourage you to do good in the world because the world needs all the good that you do, that I do, that we do together. All power to the people. Overnight. You're doing the best you can. Mm -hmm. Over the mountain, under the big blue sky, you got a dream awaiting. I can see it in your eye. It may not come easy, but you know you've got a friend. I'll be by your side the entire ride. Just let me hear you say amen. Are you doing, doing, are you doing the best you can? Mm -hmm. Tell me, are you doing, doing, are you doing the best you can? Mm -hmm. Too done, ask her to done, le meilleur de toi même. Can. Tell me, are you doing?